G'day, my name's Lloyd Grolleman, I'm the Aussie Pastor. Welcome to our in-depth Bible study on the book of Revelation. We've done Revelation 1 and we've done Revelation 2 and I've got to tell you I really enjoyed the Bible study with you as we got into it. In fact, Hunty, now Hunty, he's the voice from the clouds, from the darkness. Yeah, that's him. He's our, what are you? I don't know. I'll put the text in. Producer, director, <laughs> lighting, camera. It's just him. He does everything. Um, if they wanted to go back and look at Revelation chapter 1 and 2, and if you haven't seen them, I'd encourage you to. How would you do it? Look, the best way is probably go to www.findjesus.tv. Yep. And you can choose on clicking on the Facebook link there or the YouTube link. I would suggest click the YouTube link. Yeah, go YouTube. Once you get to YouTube, there's a Revelation playlist. YouTube's better than Facebook. <laughs> Love it. Always has been. Go YouTube. Better you quality, full HD. Yeah, I just like YouTube better. Cool. Um, now, th- this is Bible study. Uh, I'm actually not trying to entertain you. Um, I do want you to stay online and stay with us, but it is Bible study. Straight out, undiluted Bible study. It's for those who want to know more. Now, this book of Revelation, I'll just remind you, it is a letter sent by Jesus. It's in your email box waiting for you to open and to read because it's a letter sent by him to us 2,000 years ago he sent it we've got it here today here it is and it's sent to show you a couple of things one the way through the end of time two what will happen at the end of time and three who will get you through the end of time and of course we know who's going to get us through it's Jesus so it's pretty important in fact, the reason I'm doing this series is because with this coronavirus, I kind of feel, you know, it, it always gives you, when stuff like this happens, you always get that apocalyptic feeling, don't you? Is it the end times? I don't know. Do you think it's the end time, Auntie? Well, it's certainly 11.59, 59 seconds. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it could well be. It could well be. There's many signs, earthquakes. There's famine, a lot of signs. Flood. Pestilence. Did you know this is not the un- only pestilence going on at the moment? Really? What else? There's a big, massive uh, um, locust plague in Africa. Yes, yes. Their food security is, is pretty poor. Wiping out entire crops. Yeah. I mean, Very bad. And, and when Jesus describes these things in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, he actually calls them the beginning of sorrows. This is the... Beginning of sorrows. I, I actually, Hunt, if you ask me, is it the end of time? I'm not absolutely sure if it's the end 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 of time, but I do believe with all my heart that it is the beginning of sorrows. And I do believe, mm-hmm. I do believe this, and I feel it and sense it inside myself that this is the time to get ready for what is coming. I, I, I do think there's for still sure. time. Yep, for sure, there's still time. Okay, let's get into this Bible study, Revelation chapter three. Let's pray before we do. Dear Lord Jesus, I just want to pray now in the name of Jesus that you will come here, you will be in this study, you will open our hearts and our minds and be convicted of our need for you to forsake and repent of the world and to come to you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. This is the last three churches. We've already done the first four. If you want to see that, you're going to have to go back and check it out. In fact... I'd suggest you go back and check it out before you watch this. So if you're watching this live, we don't mind if you switch it off. Go back to Revelation chapter 1, www.findjesus.tv. Go back there and look at Revelation 1 and then look at Revelation 2 and then check us out here at Revelation 3. Because it is it is kind of like a, a story that follows one on after the other. And you've got to put your foundations down to understand the story. So let's get into it. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is a message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Well, write this letter to the angel. Write this letter. Jesus is with John. John is on Patmos, remember. He's 90, 95 years of age. Jesus comes to him in vision. And he, a part of the vision, which is the entire book of Revelation, is a message that Jesus gives to seven churches. Seven churches in what was then ancient Greek, now modern day Turkey. These seven churches, they were really foundation churches of the apostles. They were church plants. They actually had not been around for a long time and jesus comes to john and he writes he he says i want you to write to these seven churches but the message to these seven churches is not just for them for you in these end times when you look at these seven churches and you need to study it and you need to read it for yourself you need to be going into it and saying what is god telling me through these churches everyone now i'll tell you something here hunty Mm -hmm. every single one of these seven churches has a message for me 
Every single one of them has something that I take out of it that Jesus is telling me. And I think you're going to find the same if you go back, read it, look at it, and study it. Now, here we've got the uh, the fifth church. We're looking at, no, the f- four. F- no, we've done four. Uh, help me with my mathematics. <laughs> this is the fifth church. We've got five, six, and seven today. Yep. It's called Sardis. Now, this is a message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit. This is a message from Jesus. Who's the sevenfold spirit? Revelation 1. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, these are big problems, this book for anti-Trinitarians. If you don't believe in the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you better not go into the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is full of the triune God. And here you've got Jesus and the Holy Spirit. This is the one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit of God and the seven stars. So he, he has the Holy Spirit. He has the Holy Spirit. He has the seven stars. Or he has the members of the seven churches in his hand. Jesus has you in his hand. Now, remember, this book is for the worthy and the unworthy. In fact, we're all unworthy, aren't we, Hunty? Sure. So this book is for the unworthy. Verse 1, I know all the things you do. And you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. This church is as dead as a doorna. People look at it and it looks alive. Have you seen churches? I've been to a church like this. Mm. looks good. Me it's too. full. The music and the worship is fabulous. The preaching is superb. They've got the best preacher in Australia, whoever that is, auntie. <laughs> um, he's inspiring them. Uh, they come in their, their, their good clothes, they mostly pay their tithe. We've all been in churches like this. Um, doesn't matter who your preacher is. doesn't matter how good your music team is. It, it doesn't matter how many attend the church. If it's dead, it's dead. And this church is dead. Empty it, vessels. They are. Mm. It looks like it's alive. It's dead. And you know what You know what makes the church dead? Do you know what makes the church dead, hunty? Uh, people who attend don't have the Yeah. Spirit. Bingo, us. Mm. Bingo. Probably shouldn't say that in a Bible study, should I? <laughs> us. We're the ones who cause the church to be dead. If we come to church alive and full of the Holy Spirit, then what's the church? Alive. Full of life. But we come to church and we don't have the Holy Spirit. We're not in touch with Jesus. We're not in a relationship with him. What are we? We're dead. So how do you know whether you're dead or alive? One of the problems of being dead is you don't know you're dead. Did you, did you know that, Auntie? <laughs> That's right. One of the problems when you're dead it's is you don't know you're stupid. dead. <laughs> What's that? It's, it's very similar if you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not say that one. If you're dead, you don't know you're dead. And, and most people who are dead, most Christians who are dead don't know they're dead. So here's a little test. I, I'm going to make it as simple as I can to tell you whether you're dead or not. Did you wake up this morning and did you ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Amen. prayer? Did you wake up this morning and did you do some Bible study? Did you wake up this morning and did you pray? As you go through the day today, are you looking for opportunities, even though you might be locked down with COVID-19, not allowed to move, are you still looking for opportunities to share Jesus as the Holy Spirit presents? And by the way, COVID-19 can't stop the Holy Spirit. You know that, hunty, eh? Sure. Can't stop him. The message of Jesus and his love to a lost world will continue to go out there. But Have you today been looking for opportunities to share his love? Because if you've asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you've done your Bible study, if you've done your prayer, if you're sharing Christ, you're alive because the Holy Spirit is in you and you won't do those things. You won't be inspired to do those things unless you have the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense, Hunty? It does. But if you don't have that experience, it's not that experience that makes you alive. It's Jesus inside of you that makes you alive, that leads you to that experience. Jesus inside you will make you in, will send you to the Bible. Jesus inside you will, will get you into prayer. Jesus inside of you will, will encourage you, will inspire you to ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus inside of you is what inspires you to share his love with others. Are you alive or are you dead? It's a good question, isn't it? I know all the things you do. And that you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Verse 2, wake up. Strength from what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. Now, this church is in trouble. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Go back to your first love. Hold to it firmly. Be like you used to be. You know, people first come to Jesus. Oh, they're on fire. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Jesus says, if you are living in Sardis, if Sardis is your experience, if you look good but you're dead inside, he's telling you to wake up 
and to repent because if you don't, when he comes, you ever think of this, when he comes it'll be as unexpected as a thief. There are people going to church who keep the Sabbath, who pay their tithe, who think they've got it right with Jesus and when he turns up for them, it's with all the troubles and all the signs, when he turns up for them, it's as unexpected as a thief in the night. Wow. wow. True story. Wow. But I like this, verse 4. Yeah, there are some in this church, just a few in Sardis, who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What's this white? All who are victorious will be clothed in white. There it is again. I'll never erase their names from the book of life, but I'll announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. What's this white? It's the robe of Christ's righteousness. And we're going to look at that more, Hunty, in this Mm -hmm. series. But when you give your heart to Jesus... He comes down and he puts his robe, he puts his personality, he puts his axe, he puts he puts himself around you so that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and not you. Praise God he doesn't see Amen. you, hunty. Amen. And praise God with Lloyd, all the problems and struggles he has, he doesn't see me. Because if he did, I'd be in trouble. But I give my heart to Jesus and he puts his robe around me. And when God looks at me, he sees Jesus. And that's what he's talking about here. It's the gospel. It's the Protestant, Protestant, Adventist gospel that you are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone by putting that robe around you. Verse 6, anyone who, anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. That's Sardis. I would call Sardis a dead church. Philadelphia. I like this church. Hey, auntie, have you been to the US? I have. How many times? Many, many times. Have you ever noticed, even in Adventist churches, how... There are a lot of churches over there that like to put Philadelphia in their name. Correct. Yeah, notice noticed that. What does it mean? Well, it actually means brotherly love. Have you been to Philadelphia, the city in, in... It's near New York, isn't it? Um, yes. On the East Coast somewhere anyway. I'm I know they have a, yeah. a pretty good basketball team. I think, that, I think an Aussie guy plays, Simmons or someone plays for Philadelphia, um, their NBA team. Uh, they're out with coronavirus, of course, at the moment too. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Philadelphia. It was the capital city, not a really important one, but it's the capital city of another 30 towns and villages around about it. They too had a temple to Artemis in their midst. Seems like, Hunty, all these mm. all these cities had pagan temples in them, which basically, and I kind of like saying this because it's what they were, were just giant brothels. Mm. You go to these temples and... Yeah, worship these pagan Greek gods, and they're all about sexual immorality. And you can imagine what that would have done to families, to husbands and wives, to marriage. It must have been devastating. Mm. But God sends the apostles, his disciples, and the early church into these towns. They convert people. Now, now the, 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 the Philadelphians, um, good church or bad church? Do you remember? I don't. Well, I can tell you that Philadelphia, the town, was the first town to mint gold or silver coins, so they knew the value of gold. Mm -hmm. This church, there are two great churches in this series of seven. There's Smyrna and there's Philadelphia. I reckon if we started another church, Hunty, I wouldn't mind calling it Philadelphia. Smyrna's a bit, bit not not a real good English name, is it? Mm, No. Smyrna Christian, I don't know, but Philadelphia sounds good. Church of Brotherly Love. Um, This is a good church. God got nothing bad to say. Jesus got nothing bad to say about this church. Look, write this letter to the angel. Write this letter to the members and the pastors of the church in Philadelphia. This is a message from the one who is holy and true. Who's that? Jesus. The one who has the keys of David. David the king has the keys. Only only the king has these keys. Jesus. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. That's how Jesus works. When he makes a decision, that's it. You can't change it. He's God. And he says, I've got a message for Philadelphia. So what does he say to them? I know all the things you do, and I've opened a door for you that no one can close. You are good guys. This is a good church. You have little strength. It's a little church, like New Hope, hunty. Mm. You are, well, he doesn't say exactly little church. He says you've little strength, but yet you have obeyed my word and you did not deny me. 
stop and think about your life for a moment and I stop and think about mine. Am I obeying God's word? It's a good question, isn't it? Do I deny Christ? Do people know I'm a follower? You know, a disciple of Christ, you you hear these people, they say, oh, you, you know, they go to work and they're working with other people and they find out there's another Adventist in the office, Christian. And they've been working for three years and they never knew it. To me, when I hear that's one of the saddest stories, because if you're having that sort of experience in your workplace, then you're denying Christ. It's the same on your social media pages and your Facebook and all the rest of it. Man, don't go on social media if it's not to share Christ. You hear me, auntie? I'm hearing you. Don't go. I can't see any reason. I would not be on Facebook. I would not be on Instagram. Man, I'm about the most un pictorial person what's the word you'd use the un- your audio but, but yeah but i don't take good pictures oh that's what i'm saying i don't want to be on instagram i can't these things to share jesus but you, you see I, I i look it kind of makes me sad but i see facebook pages all over the place with christians who are really right and yet they never mention christ and to be silent about christ in this time especially as the holy spirit's given you opportunities to share him it's almost a crime. Not this church. I know all the things you do, Philadelphia, says Jesus, and I've opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you've obeyed my word and you don't deny me. Jesus likes that. Look, I'll force those who belong to Satan's synagogues, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come out and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love because you obeyed my command to persevere. I will protect you from that great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Look, what he's saying here is there's a synagogue. This is a real Jewish synagogue in the town of Philadelphia. Uh, they are misbehaving. They are enemies of God. In fact, Jesus calls them the synagogue of Satan, and they're attacking this infant, this small, this weak church. And yet this church is standing up. It's, being, it's persevering. It's being faithful. It's being loyal, and it's obeying his word. And Jesus looks at them and says, look, don't worry about these people who are oppressing you. Are you being oppressed for your walk with Christ? Don't worry about it. He says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to say to them, look, they're on my side all the time. You never were. And if you're going through that experience and you're being oppressed for your walk of Christ, don't worry. There'll come a day, you hear me, hunty? I am. When God will justify you. It will come. It will come. And he said to this church, look, because you've been so faithful and loyal under pressure, you're not going to go for any persecution. You're not going to go for any testing. You've already proved to me that you are made of gold. Love that. Verse 11, I'm coming soon. Oh, I hope so. Lord, please come soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. And I'll write on them the name of my God, and they'll be citizens in the city of my God. They'll become temples. They'll become pillars, sorry. They'll become pillars in the temple. And that means you'll always be there. He'll give us a new name. We'll be citizens of this new city, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone who hears must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. He's basically saying to Philadelphia, you're the good guys, you're going to heaven. It won't be long, I'm going to come back, you're going to heaven. When you go to heaven, you're going to be a pillar, you're going to be there forever. Uh, I'm going to make you citizens. I'm going to give you a new name. We talked about that in Revelation too, good stuff. And if you've got ears, you need to hear it, you need to know and you need to understand. The last church, the seventh church, finally we make it. Has it been a long road? I don't know, hunty. <laughs> I think we got through it pretty quick, eh? Yeah, well done. Yeah, let's go. Verse 14. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Adventists love Laodicea. We might not know all the other churches, <laughs> but we know we Laodicea. Laodicea is us. Have you heard that? Preachers getting up the front and thundering from the pulpit with rumblings and lightning that the church, the Adventist church, is Laodicea. Well, there might be some truth in it, actually. (laughs) Let me 
tell you a little bit about Laodicea first. It was located on a hill between two rivers. It was originally, this will give you a, a kind of an insight into this city, it's originally called the city of Zeus. Zeus, the great pagan god, the enemy of the great Hebrew god. Of course, Zeus doesn't exist. He's just a, a pagan god with no power, that never just a demon really. Um, but they had this huge temple of Zeus in Laodicea. It was on a major trade route, so Laodicea itself was wealthy. Um, and I'll tell you how wealthy they were. In 60 AD, 60 years after Jesus was born, so not 30-odd years after he'd gone back to heaven, the, a great earthquake just broke that city in half. Um, the emperor, who was Nero, well, we don't think good of Nero. If you know anything about history, this is not a good guy. But he offered to pay to rebuild Laodicea. They're so rich, they're so wealthy, they said, forget it, we'll do it ourselves. And they did it, and they did it in a couple of years. And it was also a big Jewish city. And the gospel had gone through the apostles to Laodicea. What does Jesus say to them? Verse 14, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Write this to the members and the ministry team of the church in Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is the amen, the faithful, true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. This is from Jesus. Now, now this church cops it. Did you know that, Hunty? Mm, tell me more. <laughs> Actually... God doesn't say nothing good about this church. They are the black sheep of the seven. Yep. Uh, now he, he's pretty much hit uh, at least five of uh, four of the previous churches really hard, but this seventh church. Wow! I know the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. Do you, do you know that the the interesting thing is that the water in Laodicea was lukewarm because it came from two sources: a very cold spring to the east. Did you know this, Auntie? Oh, and a very hot spring to the west. And the water would come in and be lukewarm. And he says, this church, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. So do you get the sense Jesus is offended here? Do you get that, oh, Auntie? Yeah, for sure. You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Mm. I don't like that naked one, do you, hunty? Not particularly. <laughs> a lot of white. Mm. I don't <laughs> like it at all. You're poor, you're blind, you're naked. So what does he say? Remember he said they're poor, they're blind, they're naked. You're going to remember that, hunty? Three things. Yep. Poor, blind, blind naked. naked. So he gives, he gives the answer. You know, Jesus never rebukes you or disciplines you without giving you the solution. So here it is. I love it. To me, this is the highlight of the seven churches, this next couple of verses. Verse 18. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold has been purified by the fire. So you're poor, buy gold. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments. You're naked. Buy some white garments from me so you'll not be ashamed by your nakedness. And you're poor, you're blind. And what was the other one? You're poor, blind, and naked. So if you're poor, buy gold. If you're naked, buy some garments. And if you're blind, look at this one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start 18 again. So I advise mm -hmm. you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. That's if you're poor. Then you'll be rich. Also buy, also buy white garments if you're naked from me so that you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes because you're blind. So you'll be able to see. Do you know what the gold is? Do you know what the white raiment is? Do you know what the eye salve is, Hunty? I'm forward to learning. <laughs> okay, the gold. I went and did a little bit of research here. When you buy gold from anybody, actually, Hunty, you're a technocrat. <laughs> what determines... How good gold is because you can buy yeah, eight carat yeah, gold, yeah. sixteen carat gold, twenty four carat. Yeah, What's purity. the difference between eight carat and twenty four? Purity. Purity. Jesus says to this church that's lukewarm, "Come to me and buy purity." Uh, I didn't realize this, but there's two ways of refining gold. Did you know this, Auntie? Roughly, yes. Do you know what they are, or you don't dare say? Oh, well, I'm happy to say. Yeah. Uh, there's heat. Yeah, and in other words, in the, fi in the fire, in the fire, right. Fire, yeah. So when you do it in the fire, the slag, they call it. Yep, it rises to the top. Rises, and you can skim it off. Mm. And so the gold's going to be more pure. Yep. What about the acid? 
Well, that's it, the chemical bath. A chemical bath. Which is the more, which will give you the best gold, do you know? I don't know. It's the acid. Uh-huh. Oh, by a long way. In fact, if you if if you're going to have 24 karat gold, which is more pure than eight karat, you've got to do it in acid. You can't get 24 karat gold. Apparently, don't don't come at me and say you're wrong, Lloyd. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm no expert on this. It's just what a, a little bit of reading I did. You can't get it unless it's put through the acid. So so God says, come to me and buy this gold by purity. How do you get it? Well, you've got to be refined. And how do you get refined? Through hard times. Did you hear that, Auntie? I did hear that. You are refined through hard times. Too often when hard times come, rather than letting them come and learning to trust in Jesus, we pray for him to take them away. Am I right? That's what I do. Yeah. But these hard times will refine you. They'll not only get you to trust. I just tried to kill a fly there. (laughs) They'll not only get you to trust God through the hard times, but they'll refine you. They will make you, as you trust him, they'll make you more like him. Does that make sense, Auntie? That's good. That's buying the gold. What about this one? Also buy white garments. That's an easy one, isn't it? Sure. We've already talked about that. Go to the Lord, repent, surrender, and he puts around you his white garment, robe of righteousness. Accept his gift. Yeah, accept Mm. it. Mm. So that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, not you. That's the white raiment. Grace. It's grace. What about the ointment for the eyes, the eye salve? What's that? That What what makes you see? Have you ever noticed when you give your heart to Jesus? Don't we ever notice this, hunty? When you give your heart to Jesus, you can see things other people can't see. You see sin when other people don't see sin. Right. In fact, it can give you a bit of grief, eh? Because sure. you see something's wrong. In you see something's wrong in what's happening out there, and you see what's wrong happening in here. Man, when I come to Jesus, one, of the, I, I, I had to make some changes, you know, because the Holy Spirit came inside of me. Do you hear who I said come inside of me? Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit. He opened my eyes, and I'm removing this stuff from my life through the grace of Christ. My friends are looking at me and saying, what are you doing that for? There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. It's not a big deal. Well, because I had eye salve. That eye salve helped me to see the sins in the world and the sins in myself. I ask again, Hunty, what's the eye salve? Mm, The ability to see sin. What gives you that ability? Or who? The Holy Spirit. You got it. The Holy Spirit is the eye salve. Buy gold. We know what that is. Let God purify you. Put on the white garment. We know what that is. Let him save you through his grace. And get some eye salve. Mm. Get born again. Don't you love that? Beautiful. Verse 19, I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Lukewarm is indifferent. And if you're indifferent to God, if you're indifferent to church, if you're indifferent to his cause and yet you're still going and you're kind of just floating along, you are lukewarm. I used to think lukewarm was a mixture of hot works and cold works and that would make you lukewarm, but it's not. Mm. Do you know what it is, Hunty? No works. Well, you might have some works, but lukewarm is having the truth. Mm. You with me? Yep. But without the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's lukewarm. That's what will make you lukewarm. Verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. He's going to spit this church out, but he's really saying, look, come in. I want to sup with you. I want to dwell with you. In fact, the way to get escape later see her and this lukewarm condition is to spend time with Jesus. Those who are victorious, verse 21, are those who are victorious will sit with me on the throne just as I was victorious and sat with the Father on my throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Seven churches, hunty. I think we're done. Done. Seven churches, each with a message that you can get for the times we live in and for your own personal life. I think, you know, as I think back on these seven churches as I... Finish. Why did God put this message in there? Why did Jesus put Jesus, who is God? Why did Jesus put this message in there for us in the last days? Because He wants us basically to repent, to turn to Him, and to have a born again walk with Him. 
I think he puts it at the beginning of the book because we're about to go, not in the next chapter or two, but soon we're about to go into some scary stuff. And he says, look, if, you, if you've got me, if you've repented, if you're in a born-again walk with me, and if you're hot with me, then what I'm about to show you is no big deal. You, you're going to sail through this because you've got me. Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Love it. How's that, hunty? Mm -hmm. We're done. Amen. Um, in a couple of nights' time, we, we, we're punching these out as quick as we can. Remember, we've got other stuff to do, Andrew and I, not the least our, our own church that we're looking after. And we, we've also got a, a television program on Channel 10 every Sunday morning. What time? 4.30. 4.30. Good time slot. <laughs> Have you ever got up and watched it live? I record it and watch it later. <laughs> <laughs> you actually do record it? I do, every week. Are many people watching it? The Facebook's getting a lot of hits and so is the YouTube of the same program. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, look, God bless you through this time. Um, I pray that this little series will be giving you peace. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being with us through this Bible study. Bless us now as we go our way and bring us back from the next Bible study as we look at Revelation 4 as you reveal your power and your authority and your strength again, reassuring us that you got this. Bless each person out there, I pray now in your name. Amen. I'm Lord Grollam and I'm Lozzy Pastor. I love you, but you know what? The Jesus who sent a message to the seven churches loves you so much more. See you in a day or two.